Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. My name is Glenn Starkman, Director of the Institute for the Science of Origins, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's talk uh, by Michael Ryan. Dr. Ryan is Curator and Head of Vertebrae Paleontology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and an ISO Fellow. He's one of the world's leading dinosaur paleontologists with particular expertise in ceratopsian, i.e. horned dinosaurs. So, since joining the Cleveland Museum of Natural History in 2004, Dr. Ryan started the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project in collaboration with the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Canada, and the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology, and has since expanded his searches to Greenland, Korea, China, and Mongolia. I'm very pleased to welcome him tonight to tell you about dinosaur horns, hooks and frills, rapid evolution in the late Cretaceous. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Ryan. Well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit about my research. You've heard a lot of different talks in the ISO series, and I probably have the lowest tech of all of them. No mass specs, no CT, scanners, no giant telescopes, just a shovel. That's all you need to dig up dinosaurs. So we're going to do a little tour through some of the research that I've been doing for the last, uh, actually last 30 plus years, but focusing on the work that I've been doing over the last 12 years while I've been here at the museum. I'm going to break the talk down into a couple of sections, hopefully one for each of our three segments. Introduction to fossils and some of the horned dinosaurs I've been working on. Um, horned dinosaur diversity, where I get to toot my horn about some of the research that I've been doing and some of the new tax I've described with some of my colleagues. And then getting to the meat of the conversation for this talk this evening, talking about the frills, those shields off the back of the horned dinosaurs, and uh, their impact on the evolution of this group of animals. So, introduction. We need to talk about fossils. We need to talk about the origin of fossils and what people have thought about them. As long as there have been people walking the earth, I'm sure there have been people picking up pieces of fossilized bone and trying to figure out what the heck are these things. So one of the very first named fossils, the binomial name, yeah, was described in 1677 by Robert Plott. You're looking at that fossil he described. It actually turns out that it will be, it will be eventually redescribed as the lower part of a femur of a megalosaurus, a large carnivorous dinosaur from, um, from the United Kingdom. But at the time that Plott first found this, um, he didn't really have anything to compare it to. At this point, the term dinosaur had not even been coined yet. So he went back to the stories he'd been heard about the ancient earth and the time when giants strode the land. So he figured, well, this looks a lot like a piece of human anatomy. Looks like a, lot of, looks like a piece of male human anatomy. So we're gonna call it scrotum humanum. <laughs> Fortunately, Buckland came along a few years later and corrected him on this. And, uh, but it's still a, a nice little story. Um, uh, Sir Richard Owen in 1842 coined the term dinosaur. And at that time, there were really only three named dinosaur. Megalosaurus, that we just talked about a moment ago. Iguanodon, a large herbivore with those big thumb spikes you've seen in so many uh, cartoons and movies. And Hylosaurus. And again, look at the reconstruction here. You can see from the internal diagram of the bones, there's only a few bones known for the animal but they've, they've reconstructed it to be something like a giant pig, maybe a crocodile. Didn't really know what they were looking at at this point. We skip ahead a little bit to the 1800s. Darwin publishes his famous Origin of the Species, and almost coincidental with this, in Bavaria, now Germany, in the Solenhof and limestones that they were coring for uh, slate, they found Archaeopteryx. Initially, they found only a single feather. Eventually, they found a full skeleton with feathers around this. And Thomas Huxley, Darwin's famous bulldog that um, trumped for or stumped for, his, um, for Darwin's origin of the species, theory of evolution, recognized that there was a very close connection between Archaeopteryx and small dinosaurs. In fact, if you took the feathers away from this skeleton and just described the bones, you would have a beautiful little perfect dinosaur. By the 1900s, um, in North America at least, the bone wars were on. Um, Marsh and Cope were moving out west. They had competing crews that were dynamiting each other's quarries. 
They were collecting massive dinosaurs to come bring back primarily to the Eastern Museums to build these beautiful displays. So Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the most famous dinosaurs, was found in 1902. <clears throat> and when it was put on display at the American Museum of Natural History and advertised, come see our giant carnivorous dinosaur, there were lineups out the door and down the street and around the building. This became the most iconic fossil ever found and really gave a face and name to dinosaurs. From there, more people got interested, more institutions wanted to collect dinosaurs, and they started moving around primarily through the, the, the northern hemisphere. Um, and some folks went to Africa as well and pulled out things like giant Brachiosaurus. We moved to the late 60s. John Ostrom is a graduate student, moves on to become a researcher, and he describes this small carnivorous dinosaur. He recognizes that, if you look at the feet closely, it has that upturned sickle saw, which has become so famous in the Jurassic Park park movies and is a near mark of what we call raptorial dinosaurs. A large stiffened tail that's held well off the ground, big, uh, big hands with claws. He, he postulated that this thing is extremely bird-like. It has hollow bones for one thing, just like modern birds. Its tail's off the ground, it has long rim, limbs that are designed for, for running, and it's got claws and these giant claws on the toe that's designed for hunting. This was a fast, mobile animal. In fact, it probably had a warm-blooded metabolism. So he brought the idea of a dinosaur renaissance or moving the dinosaurs from the swamps where they had to physically submerge themselves in the water to support their, their body weight to being fast-moving, almost wolf-like animals in the case of this. One of his students, Robert Bacher, who's been here to speak at the museum in the past, really took up that torch and carried forward the idea that dinosaurs had, active, had an active, um, high temperature metabolism, at least for the small body carnivores, and probably had a diverse sociobiology that we just don't understand, or that we didn't understand at that point. Nowadays, we've gone to China, some places in North America. We realize that many small carnivorous dinosaurs, and some of the larger ones, are covered with nice downy feathers. On the wings of this little dromaeosaur, you actually have what are proto-flight feathers. And when you look at the systematics of small carnivorous dinosaurs and where they grade into birds, remember, all birds are living dinosaurs. It's almost impossible to tell where dinosaur, in the old term, stops and where um, birds start. If you look at the number of birds that are alive today, and remember, birds are living dinosaurs, we've got about 10,000 species. If you look at the number of species of dinosaurs that we've known through their entire history from the Mesozoic from about uh, 230 to 66 million years ago, we have 60 named species for those millennia. So I suspect there's a high hidden diversity of dinosaurs back then, but it makes dinosaurs the most successful group of animals that have ever walked or flown over the land. Although there was a large terminal extinction 66 million years ago, dinosaurs didn't go extinct. They flew forward and they're still with us today. So I work primarily on horned horn dinosaurs. This is the cover to a book I published a few years ago, which is sort of a, a large overview for the various groups of large and small bodied dinosaurs. This is a somewhat fanciful reconstruction of a Chasmosaurus, which is common in the late Cretaceous of Montana and Alberta. It shows some of the key characteristics of at least large-bodied ceratopsids. They're herbivorous. So at the front of the face, they have a unique bone on the top of their beak called a rostral bone, matches uh, the predentary on the bottom. That mouth was used to crop probably vegetation, a, a dental battery of multiple teeth, which would have sliced through vegetation and then move that down to its gut where there would have been a large formatory cavity. Um, it's got this large shield off the back of the frill. The earliest ones had a very small shield. As they get, as you move towards the iconic triceratops, they get larger. They have ornamentation on their skulls. They have typically a horn on the nose. They've got large horns over the eyes and they have a series of small bony um, um, epimarginals, as we call them, small extra bony ossifications that rim the margin of the shield and can develop into hooks, spikes, and all kinds of various excrescences. Um, the first one was named by Cope in 1782. Triceratops was discovered and named a couple of years later, 1899. And the term ceratopsia, which means horned face, was coined by Marsh in 1890. And we'll be talking generally about ceratopsians or ceratopsids. Um, the terms are interchangeable for the course of what we're talking about this evening. So uh, where does it sit in the tree of life for dinosaurs? You can see there are two branches here. Off to the right in the branch that ends with birds, 
That's the sauricea. It includes the large-bodied sauropods like Haplocanthosaurus, which is the logo of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. It includes all the carnivorous dinosaurs, including the iconic Tyrannosaurus rex. And birds are nested, no pun intended, right within that group of dinosaurs. The other branch is the Ornithischia. It includes the majority of the herbivorous dinosaurs. And you can see they're branching off at the top to the right of that branch, something called the Marginocephalia. That just means the ceratopsian dinosaurs and all their closest relatives. And we're just going to focus on the large-bodied and some of the small-bodied ceratopsids for the course of this talk. Where are they found? Primarily the Northern Hemisphere. We believe that ceratopsians originated in Asia in the middle, uh, early, late Jurassic, and then migrated to North America and may have gone back and forth a couple of times. There's a few, um, key, there's a few specimens which are equivocal from the Southern Hemisphere. There's an actual upper arm bone that's named from Australia, which may or may not be a ceratopsian. And there's a specimen which is so intriguing. It was found in uh, South America, and now it's lost. But the description is a ceratopsian, so we're hoping that turns up again sometime. Dinosaurs, as we think of them as large-bodied animals, excluding the modern birds, lived during the Mesozoic. So Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous in the middle of this illustration by Ray Troll, a great cartoonist and a great scientist. So the first dinosaurs appeared in middle to late Triassic. The first horned dinosaurs appeared probably as far back as the middle Jurassic. And then things like Triceratops appear in the last two million years before that terminal extinction event. So the large body dinosaurs are at the end of the age of the Cretaceous. I'm gonna just pull this time scale out a little bit to talk about uh, just um, where they sit in time. So this is a modified illustration from the great god Google, which I got off Wikipedia. Answers all things about dinosaurs and everything else. The names aren't important that you see in the middle of that chart. And if you can't read them, don't worry about them. They're a series of mostly um, specimens, at least on the left-hand side, um, small-bodied horned dinosaurs that came from Asia. So this is a little diagram shows you typically what they look like. The various earliest things like Cetacosaurus, um, the very earliest horned dinosaurs actually don't have any horns on their face. They came a little bit later. <clears throat> and if you look at their body size, they're between 10 to um, 100 kilograms. So relatively small, and by the, <clears throat> um, what else do I have to say about that? Yeah, so relatively small. You can notice the frill doesn't have any horns. We said that already. So if we move a little bit later in time to the late Cretaceous, starting about 90 million years ago, we have the large-bodied ceratopsids appear. Um, they um, are between 100 to 1,000 plus kilograms. Triceratops at the end of the Cretaceous is actually a body size larger than anything that came before it. Some of the things like Stracosaurus and Centrosaurus I'll be talking about. And one of the unique innovations they made about 90 million years ago a little bit younger than that is this complex tooth factory I alluded to before where the teeth are set three or four deep in the jaw and actually arranged side by side. So there were literally hundreds of teeth in the jaw. And as this animal um, chewed vegetation or maybe ground vegetation, sliced vegetation, these wore down and eventually fell out of the mouth. So we're going to be focusing on primarily the large-bodied ceratopsians. That's what I specialize in. They come in two categories the centrosaurine and the chasmosaurines. The chasmosaurine there in the bottom are typified by things like triceratops. Um, we're gonna talk specifically about the skulls. If you cut the skulls off a horned dinosaur and just look at their bodies, you could not tell genus or species. But all you need is a piece of the frill, piece of the shield, and you can actually name a brand new type of dinosaur on that. Trust me, I've done it multiple times. I'm that good. So for the chasmosaurs, they're noted for having very large horns over the brow. They're, they have a short horn over the nose, and the frills that come off the back have almost no or extra ornamentation. The centrosaurs are the reverse. They have a very large horn over the nose. They have very short horns over the eyes. Then they have, as in the case of, uh, I guess, Stracosaurus, up there, large spikes coming off the back. You mentioned that they're... Uh the teeth wear down, do they replace them? Or once the teeth are worn down, they starve? Dentists hate dinosaurs because they always replace their teeth. Um, they don't necessarily, so if you, you may have heard uh, people talk about large body tyrannosaurs or the carnivorous dinosaurs where their big spike-like teeth do drop out after they've been worked for a while in 
herbivorous dinosaurs, like the duck-billed dinosaurs and the ceratopsians, they tend to wear the teeth beside each other. So they rarely shed the teeth, but as they wear down, there are new teeth pushing up from below. There's a tooth battery that's three or four teeth deep, whether it's in the maxilla or the lower dentary. So throughout the course of their entire life, they never run out of teeth, unlike uh, mammals or humans that have two sets of teeth, a deciduous and an adult teeth. And once we lose our adult teeth, that's it for us. I see on your diagram there that the Centrosaurine and the Chasmosaurine Very good. have, <laughs> thank you, have different rib bones. Is there, a, along with the frills being different and the horns placement, is that rib significant? For classification? Um, I think if you actually looked, uh, if it was a less schematic diagram, I think you'd recognize that the, the, there are the same number of ribs and they really have the same shape. What we've got on the bottom, um, the, that schematic diagram is actually a triceratops and they are almost another thousand pounds bigger than the animal above it, which is Strachosaurus. So their Strachosaur and its uh, closest relatives are very gracile compared to a big giant Triceratops. If you've seen our Triceratops in our gallery, it's like a giant tank. The other, the Centrosaurines are more like a very friendly bull that you may not want to have you chase in the field, but it's still pretty friendly and it just has a lighter body build. That's reflected in those diagrams. Could you please actually point out where the frill is on these diagrams and where the shield is? And I, I was told I couldn't point, but I'm going to walk over there and, and point out what it is. So this is the shield off the back of the skull, and you've got the horn over the eye and another short horn over the back, uh, over the nose. So if you put the hand, you put your hand on the back of your head, that's the bone that you're touching is primarily what's called the parietal bone. In humans, we're somewhat unique in vertebrate skulls that all our bones fuse together. Um, dinosaurs don't tend to fuse them as tightly. And it's that parietal bone that actually gets stretched out and pulled um, over the course of evolutionary history of these animals into these giant thin shields. We're gonna talk a little bit about why we think that may happen in the last part of the talk tonight. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Michael Ryan, giving us an introduction to horned dinosaurs. For more information on the Origins Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Ryan will tell us about the wide diversity of those horned dinosaurs. Now, back to the talk. So, part two, horned dinosaur diversity. This is the part that always runs long whenever I time myself giving this talk, because I get to talk about all the cool things I found and the cool people I've worked with. So I want to talk a little bit about where I go do my field work. As I mentioned, I've been doing field work for more than 30 years now, and my knees feel it. Um, I've, I'm Canadian, as you can probably tell from my accent, so the majority of my early part of my career was working in Alberta, and I've actually extended that to work as I'm working here in Montana. If you go back to the late Cretaceous of North America, North America is bisected by a large inland sea called the Western Interior Seaway, which I think shows up in blue in the middle of that illustration. The land masses to the west and east are, east are called Laramidia and Appalachia, and the majority of the dinosaurs um, are sort of hug the, hug, the, hug the western coastline of the western interior seaway. Like today, back in the Cretaceous, there were Rocky Mountains. Those Rocky Mountains were very high, and as water washed down off of them, they had only one place to go, which was towards the western interior seaway, unless they went to the ocean on the other side. So as water flowed down to the Western Interior Seaway, it carried a lot of sediments. And there were dinosaurs living on the plain adjacent to that seaway. And when they died, they had an opportunity to get washed in a storm event into one of the river channels, cover it with sediment and potentially fossilize. So that's why we go to the Western side of North America, Montana, Wyoming, Alberta, Utah to find our dinosaurs because we have the largest amount of material there. There were dinosaurs living on the Appalachia side, but there's a variety of reasons why we don't find as many. We didn't have the large sediment input from the mountains that weren't as high, or in some cases weren't there in Appalachia, at least in the northern part of that. Glaciers pulled away a lot of the sediments. Um, so I'm working right along the Montana border, just a little bit north of it in the southeastern corner of Montana, of, of Alberta. 
And every year I take a crew out with me of staff from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I join my colleagues from the Toronto Museum in Drumheller and the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And the majority of my crew is made up of students. I take students from Case Western Reserve. Hopefully in the future we'll take some ISO students. Hopefully some of you will join me in Mongolia in, in uh, 2017. And then I've got students from a variety of universities up in Canada that become my field crews in exchange for doing field courses with me. One of the things that we like to find are ceratopsian bone beds. Bone beds are essentially graveyards. And when you're looking at bone beds in North America, those bone beds tend to be to preserve one type of animal. So it's, a mono, it's what we call a monogeneric bone bed. You only tend to find one animal in there. In this case, we're working on a centrosaurus bone bed from the Old Man Formation of the Lake Cretaceous. We find uh, probably tens, there, in this bone bed, there are probably tens to hundreds of thousands of bones uh, preserved. Um, and we spend our summers working through these things and digging them up. We don't tend to find full skeletons. What we do is we find disarticulated skeletons with the bones all jumbled up. We uh, map these things and photograph them. Um, we old style, when you work on a quarry, is to draw the bones that you see in the ground on a two-dimensional map with a paper and pencil. The grid there is one meter each, and every year we come back with the crew and we sequentially move towards the top margin of that map where the hill is, and we expose more and more bones. Very diagrammatic here, but the longer bones would be limb bones, and there's a variety of skull bones and other things in there. We now augment that with a digital photography that we can then stitch together in Mesh Lab and other digital programs to give us a three-dimensional map. Sometimes the three-dimensional maps aren't as good as the 2D maps because it's very difficult to tell, to tell small brown fragments of fossilized bone from small brown rocks. So old-style maps are still very good. One of the nice things about working on bone beds, especially when they preserve large numbers of animals that have disarticulated and fallen apart, is that you don't just find one or two bones from one animal. You find them from a variety of animals, one type, but from a variety of ages. So what I've illustrated here is, this, is the, what's called the post-orbital bone. It's the bone that surrounds the eye socket in a horned dinosaur. Um, it's also the bone that carries the, the horn that will grow in Triceratops to that long horn. So from A to J, you're looking at a growth series from A, which is a newly hatched little horned dinosaur. The O there indicates where the, where the orbit would be, a tiny little millimeter high horn. As we go down through F to G, we're actually looking at animal, animal, animals that have obtain their full adult size, and they have small but very robust horns. And then as these animals get more mature, um, essentially stop growing, that horn, for lack of a better word, is reabsorbed by the body. That bony tissue is just is vanishes, and you're left with a small depression pit. And we think this is related to sexual maturity. Um, when you're small and young, um, you're not reproducing, so you don't have any outward indicators that you are available to reproduce. When you hit your teenage years and become sexually mature, you are available to mate and lay eggs. And then at some point, you pass your peak of, of optimum fitness, and you're no longer part of the breeding population. And we think that's when we lose those horns on these animals. So bone beds are good because they not only allow us to reconstruct skeletons that go into museums, they give us some insight into the paleobiology of the animals themselves. How do the bone beds form? This is a beautiful painting by my friend Mike Skrepnik in Alberta. On the left there, we have a number of horned dinosaurs, centrosaurs, which are uh, trying to cross a river in flood. There's a storm above them. The water is very turbulent. Some of them drown. They get washed up on a shoreline. They get pulled apart by small carnivorous dinosaurs. We find tooth marks on all these things. They rot. Eventually, the bones disarticulate, and another flooding event will wash those individual bones back into a channel. They'll get covered over with sediment and fossilized, potentially. And then our young paleontologist wanders the badlands of Alberta or Montana, finds a few bones sticking out, works around those, and eventually she's found a bone bed where she can collect all these dinosaur bones. So is there a modern analog that we can show that animals like dinosaurs did die en masse? Well, lots of evidence for that. In South Africa, we have Cape water buffalo that do die en masse, drowning. There's historical references today of cattle and buffalo drowning in North America. This photograph here is, is my go-to photograph to uh, illustrate this. It's about 10,000 caribou that drowned in the, the early 1980s in northern Quebec. They were trying to cross a reservoir during a storm event, and literally more than 10,000 animals drowned in the course of a few hours. 
they washed up on the shoreline the next morning and the wildlife services just had to burn the bodies to prevent disease. So if this had occurred back in the Cretaceous, we may have had today a beautiful bone bed full of caribou. So switching to horned dinosaurs that I've worked on are named. When I came to the museum, I wanted to start a new uh, novel research program. So I had worked uh, many years in what's called the Dinosaur Park Formation, the little yellow block up there, which goes from about 76 and a half to 75 million years. It's been worked by um, paleontologists for more than 120 years. We know a lot about the Dinosaur Provincial Park. There's more than 40 named species. There's more than 400 full skeletons. There's more than 1,000 bone beds there when you include all the microvertebrate localities. We understand it really well. What we don't understand is the old man formation that lies below it. There's very little outcrop. Um, the outcrop that is there has historically not had a lot of dinosaurs found in it. So of course, that's where I wanted to go to start my new research program. Start someplace hard. <coughs> in about the year 2000, we had three dinosaurs, three horned dinosaurs named from the Dinosaur Park Formation. Um, Stracosaurus on the upper left, Centrosaurus below that, and then we had two Chasmosaurus, Chasmosaurus belli and Russelli. As of today, thanks to my crews that I've been working with, this is what we have. We've named more than a dozen new dinosaurs. Many of them have been horned dinosaurs, and many of them have been centrosaurs, which is what I started off my career many years ago. And many of these, although it's not indicated in this illustration, are actually from the old man formation. So what I'm trying to do is build up a database of new information about the dinosaurs that are in the old man formation so I can compare the tempo and mode, the speed and type of evolution that's going on in the old man formation to what we think is going on for the Dinosaur Provincial Park formation. And we'll talk a little bit about this, hopefully if I've got time at the end of this segment. So I'm gonna move up, up through time and talk about some of the dinosaurs I've been lucky enough to work on. On the left-hand side, there's a little yellow graph, 79 at the bottom and 85 at the top, just are millions of years ago. And I'm gonna work from older to younger, and essentially we're walking up section. If you uh, are walking along the, the Milk River where I work in Alberta, um, at the base where the river's flowing, it's about 79 to 80 million years old. You hike up to the top of the hill where you parked your truck, 80 or 90 meters above that, you've gone up in time by two or three million years. So we're gonna walk up through time. So um, Xenoceratops, we named it a few years ago. It got commemorated on a Canadian uh, silver coin, by the mint for $20, woo hoo. We look at the skull, and that's the main thing that's facing you here because those are the important features. It's hard to see in this illustration, but it has almost no horn over its nose. Essentially, it's just a flat, low boss. It has large horns over its eye, though. And if you remember, last part of the talk, I told you that chasmosaurs had large horns over the eyes, but centrosaurs didn't. Well, it turns out when you go back to look at the dinosaurs that are close to the split of the two subfamilies, chasmosaurs and centrosaurs, those centrosaurs close to that split actually do have large brow horns. And then off the back of this, we see that those extra ossifications along the margin of the frill are developing into large spikes or hooks. Xeno means strange, strange horned face. Uh, nothing to do with the alien movies. Then if we move up in time a little bit, there's Alberta Ceratops. There's a uh, illustration there on the upper left. Again, it has large horns over its eyes. In fact, it was the first centrosaur that we ever discovered that had large brow horns which tweaked us onto um, this interesting idea that the early centrosaurs had large brow horns. It's hard to see, but at the edge of that drawing, there's a little tiny nose horn, uh, much bigger than the one we saw for Xenoceratops. This is a little bit younger. This is a photograph of the quarry. <clears throat> and of course, the quarry is always on the top of the highest hill furthest from your truck. The truck is parked over on the other side of the river, about two miles away. So we had to get about 20 people to drag our big field block down a hill. Um, much sweat and, and work ensued, but it always works out. But inevitably, the best fossils are found the furthest away from your truck at the end of the day. <laughs> Almost coincidental with this, we have an animal called Wendy Ceratops. What's unique about this, if you look closely on this beautiful illustration by Danielle Defoe, is that it has a short horn over its nose. So we're moving from the no horn to a small horn to a larger horn over the nose. Still has large, large brow horns, and it's got these big teeth-like um, excrescences off the back of the frill that are very similar to a horned dinosaur known from Asia called Cynoceratops. Um, there's an interesting story. I just have to tell you a slight uh, deviation on 
Ceratopsy and Evolution to mention, we dug a big hole for this. We spent eight weeks over two summers just digging a hole to get this dinosaur out of the ground. Um, so my volunteers and students who came out for four weeks with me said, hey, I'm gonna go find dinosaur bones. Every day we drove an hour and a half to our site, dug and jackhammered for eight hours, and then drove back to our camp and did it every day for four weeks. The reason we did that is because our friend Wendy Sloboda found some skull bones at the bottom of that hill. And actually, and we assumed those bones were going into the hill. We were right, fortunately. So we decided we'd open up a very large area to maximize the number of bones that we could get out. We found enough to actually reconstruct the entire skeleton or the majority of the skeleton. And we announced this last year to much acclaim. Um, Wendy, if it wasn't for Wendy Sloboda, I would not have a job. Um, she has found almost every significant fossil I've ever found or ever described. Um, when people want to find things in places you can't find bones, you take Wendy. When I went to Greenland two years ago, I took Wendy. She was the only, thing, only person that found anything. Wendy became a story enough herself because Wendy has many tattoos. They're all fossils. So the first thing she did when we named the dinosaur after her was get Danielle to take that illustration and have a friend of Danielle's tattoo it on her arm. So eventually, Wendy is so prolific that she's gonna run out of space on her body to <laughs> tattoo the dinosaurs that she finds. This is an animal called Coronosaurus. Um, some of my friends call it broccoli ceratops because on the back of the frill, you'll see a series of short spikes. Those spikes appear to look like broccoli to some people. But what we see here in this dinosaur is that there's very large horns over the nose. The horns over the eyes are getting shorter and we're getting a lot more ornamentation off the back of the frill. If we go up in time again, we have our famous Centrosaurus that, was, that predates me by many decades. Large banana-like hooks off the back of the frill, very short horns over the eyes, and in this specimen, the nasal horn is actually flopping over a little bit to the front. As we move up in time towards 75 million years ago, we've got Styracosaurus. Although it's slightly cut off here, the, the horn over the nasal is enormous. We call it a nasal horn cannon, it's so big. And it has some of the most ornate ornamentation off the back of the frill. Um, a Shilosaurus is at the top that has no horns whatsoever. And what we've shown is that um, we're seeing the same patterns of evolution in the lower old man as we're seeing in the upper dinosaur park formation. And I'll elaborate upon that in the next part of the, part of the talk. On the map of the bone bed, there was a, what looked like a polar coordinate right. thing. I was wondering what that was. So the polar coordinates is indeed actually that. When we map our bone beds, we're actually um, delving into the science of what's called taphonomy, which is the study of how animals die and enter the fossil record. So when you collect a fossil, um, the fossil in and of itself is actually almost the least important things in some cases. You need to be able to document where it came from, both geographically and stratigraphically, and you need to look at the rock sediment that it comes from to understand about the depositional environment. We also take polar coordinates, or we take compass coordinates off the bones themselves because we know that they were laid down in usually flowing water conditions, and if your bone bed is large enough, you can actually map the orientations of the bone and actually map the waterways. So long limb bones will either move um, perpendicular or parallel to that. And in fact, with um, large ceratopsian centra, the vertebra that make up the backbones, the centra will act as a pivot point and the long neural arch that comes off the top, those bumps that run down your back, those neural arches, will actually in some cases um, rotate and orient in the direction of flow. So that's what that portal coordinates are doing. We're trying to see is there a preferential um, direction for flow or orientation of those bones. We do a, a simple statistical test on that and that tells us whether we are going one direction or another. So you mentioned that um, one of the hypotheses for the purpose of their um, frills and horns was to say that they were in their mating and breeding time. Potentially, yes. Are there any other prominent theories about the purpose of frills and horns? Well, that's a perfect lead into my next section. I'm going to defer that question for a moment just while I, um, so I don't give away all the story that I'm going to be doing, but the short answer is yes. And there's a number of competing theories. So if we don't cover all those competing theories in this section, ask me afterwards. So we've seen a trend in the uh, reduction of the horns over the eyes and um, an enlargement of the nasal horns. Is there a trend to be seen in the ornamentation, the size of the ornamentation and the frills? 
So we're, uh, the question is regarding the ornamentation of those large frills off the back of the dinosaurs. I've been showing you primarily um, members of the centrosaur family, and there indeed is a, a, a trend towards that. Uh, they tend to start off with fairly small um, horns at the corner of the frill, and these things get larger and get pulled out like taffy as you move towards the more recent members of the family. When you look at the um, chasmosaurines, things exemplified by triceratops, they rarely produce anything in the way of really ornate ornamentation. In fact, um, the trend almost seems to be um, the modif modification and reduction of the ornamentation, whereas in really old individuals, the small triangular processes that, that line the frill actually uh, modifying to low mounds, which almost become indistinguishable from the bone. And remembering that these frills are gonna be covered with uh, tissue, skin, um, I think in life you would not be able to see those modifications. I should also mention that when I've been, sometimes when you've seen these frills, there's two big openings in them, at least for some of the dinosaurs. And in life, those openings would not be visible. They'd be covered with skin and soft tissue. What sort of, uh do you have any sense of the blood supply to those horns and frills and things? It seems as though if you have an animal that weighs a thousand kilos, it has to have a big heart, high blood pressure, in order to get blood out there. It does. So we do have some ideas. So if I step back for a moment and talk about the, um, the long neck sauropods, things like Hapacanthosaurus and Brachiosaurus, whose heads can be several dozens of meters above the ground, that's when you run into real problem with blood flow trying to get it from the heart many meters above the ground up to the heads. And as reconstructed, there's a series of ways that you can do that. And some paleontologists working with modern anatomists think they figured that out. When you look at things like even the largest modded horned dinosaur, which would be Taurosaurus and Triceratops, their brain is not that far off the ground, or their brain differentially is not that far above their heart. So in terms of pumping it from the heart to the brain, it's only going up a couple of feet at the most. So really not a lot different between a very tall basketball player. But you're right, the bodies are massive. And on the, the ornamentation on the skull, certainly over the base of the horns, over the eyes, and deeply impressed upon the, the shields, there are what we, what we interpret to be the impressions of blood vessels. So the blood vessels, as they lay across the uh, they form a network across the shields, both above and below. And with the interaction of biological tissue, the, um, the veins and arteries impress upon the bone and the bone is modified around those. So we actually have what we call blood vessel grooves. And there are some people who postulate that <clears throat> those deep grooves <clears throat> over the shield may reflect um, um, a base of a large vascular tissue that may have been in the soft tissue. So perhaps you're doing things some of the ceratopsian frills may be doing things like modern chameleons, being able to change color or flush their, <coughs> their shields with blood for uh, display purposes. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Michael Ryan. Dr. Ryan searches for dinosaur fossils in Canada, Mongolia, and Greenland. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the many different types of horned dinosaurs. In our final segment, Dr. Ryan will discuss how the horned dinosaurs got their frills. Now, back to our talk. So I just want to finish off with a couple of the points that I was trying to lead up to last time. If we look at the dinosaur park and old man formation, and we talk about the number of ceratopsian dinosaurs we find in the, in the dinosaur park formation, in roughly a million and a half to two million years, when you stack up all the horned dinosaurs that are there, they turn over roughly every 250, every 2,000 to 250,000 years. When you actually look at the turnover of large vertebrates in the fossil record in general, the turnover range is somewhere between a million and a half to five million years. So if we're getting four or five or six different types of horned dinosaurs occurring that quickly, something must be going on with their rates of evolution. And that seemed anomalous to us for the dinosaur park formation. So we wanted to test that by looking at what was going on in the old man formation. We were fortunate in finding a number of new horned dinosaurs in the old man formation, and it turns out that we're seeing exactly the same thing. The turnover, one animal place in the other, in the fossil record is roughly every 20,000 years. So that suggests that there is probably something unusual going on compared to other large-bodied vertebrates. And 
there's a reason that that is the case, and we're going to talk, or there's a reason that we believe that, and we're going to move on to that right now when we talk about uh, frills and evolution. <clears throat> so we've talked about this just briefly, and I'll touch on this again. What the heck were the frills used for? Ever since they found the first horned dinosaurs over 150 million, 150 years ago, people have tried to postulate on why did an animal like a dinosaur want to elongate the frill off the back of its skull? There's a number of suggestions. Was it for muscle attachments? Was it for defense? Or was it for display? So the muscle attachment was the first one that was thought about. And if you look at, if anybody has done a cadaver course in uh, medical school or anybody who's done a comparative anatomy course and um, dissected a cat or something else, you've learned the muscles of the skull. And you realize that on the back of the lower jaw, there's a series of large muscles that run off to the back of the skull. And when you pull the shield off a horned dinosaur, that large opening, called the supertemporal fenestra, can act as a margin for muscles. And some of the earliest paleontologists who weren't anatomists or biomechanic anatomists suggested that the longer the muscle, which would attach to the very back of that frill, would give you a stronger bite force. Well, it turns out muscles don't work that way. The longer the muscle doesn't necessarily give you a increased bite force. In fact, it can be exactly the, the difference. So it's not that the shields could not act as a um, act at least as an anchor for some of the jaw muscles, it just probably did not, those muscles did not stretch the back of the frill. The next thing people thought about was defense. Everybody goes to human, human uh, analogies and people think of armored knights carrying shields to protect themselves from swords and those, those frills off the back of the dinosaurs are often called shields. So could that shield prevent an attack from a large carnivorous dinosaur? In most cases, probably not, although they look very uh, sturdy. And when you pick up a fossilized frill of a horned dinosaur, it's really heavy. That's because it's fossilized. When you look at the original organic bone pre-fossilization, it's relatively light. And some of those shields are extremely thin. So if something like a large Tyrannosaur, a Gorgosaurus or a Splutosaurus tried to bite into that, it would probably snap it almost instantly. That doesn't quite hold true for Triceratops. Triceratops is one of the last dinosaurs to evolve at the end of the Cretaceous. It has a very robust, thick, solid shield. Coincidentally, the, la the, um, the only large carnivorous dinosaur in most parts of North America at the same time as Triceratops is T-Rex. So a large carnivorous dinosaur needs a large meat source, which would be a herbivorous dinosaur like Triceratops. Triceratops and T-Rex would have had to interact, and I suspect that the the large shield frill off the back of Triceratops may have provided at least some protection against an attack. But nowadays, we think mostly that these shields are large display devices. Um, we know that we have living dinosaurs in birds today, and many of the birds have soft tissue features that um, feathers and other things that come off of them, which are purely for display. They're not for feeding. They're not for movement. They're just to attract a mate. And we think that the shields are some sort of communication device some, between members of its own species. This brings us into the talk of sexual selection, which is an idea developed by Charles Darwin. <clears throat> he proposed it as a component of natural selection to help elaborate, to explain elaborate and apparently non-adaptive sexual traits. Um, these traits could evolve if they were sexually selected, which means that they reproduce the reproductive success of an animal, even though its survival may go down. And there's a couple of examples of this that we'll talk about. So there's intersexual selection. Everybody's seen this. Competition between same sex, usually males, for access to mates. Everybody's seen bighorn sheep in the provincial parks fighting. They've seen things like these caribous fighting. Males try to control resources for reproduction. Remember, as, in, as a living organism, the, your only job is to, in the bigger scheme of things, is to try to move your DNA to the next generation. At least it is for, that's at a biological level. So if you are a large male with a large rack on your skull and you can get into a shoving match with another caribou who is smaller, more gracile with a smaller rack, you can outcompete him and probably control a harem of females that will enhance your rep reproductive success. The other type of sexual selection is inter intersexual selection, where one sex, usually the females, chooses, to, uh, chooses members of the opposite sex and they will often choose them based upon these ornate display devices. 
So again, one of the perfect examples that we've seen in all our textbooks are the peacock. These large feathers, which aren't, you know, these large display feathers off the tail, which can't, they're not used to catch prey items. They're not used to run away from things that are trying to eat them. They're only used to attract females. So there's a number of ideas why this would develop. Um, if you can support a large ornate display, it means you're a very fit male and females will choose to, uh, to mate with you. Do we see this, or how would this possibly work in dinosaurs? So if we take the example of these triceratops, um, intersexual selection, we, we could postulate that um, those two horns over the eyes could be used in a locked combat battle. We have no direct evidence that this ever happened despite all of the Discovery Channel um, documentaries you've seen where this has occurred. It's still speculation. However, when you think about, you, you draw analogies to living animals, it's not unrealistic that two triceratops, two competing males would push each other around. And there is some supporting fossil evidence. Some of the frills, and the frills made up of a midline bone called the parietal and two side bones called the scamosals, some of those components of the shields have lesions or holes in them, which some paleontologists have speculated are actually caused by those horns inter, uh, penetrating through the shield. So were they used in intersexual uh, inter selection, interspecific combat? We don't know, but it, it makes for a great story. And then there's intersexual selection. This is an illustration by my friend Julius Chitney. He was here this weekend. If anybody came to our Dino Fest and saw him talk about how he draws dinosaurs, he draws them very well. These are a variety of um, mostly uh, center serene dinosaurs. And you're looking at the variety of hooks and horns that come off the, the eyes, the nose, and the shield. Each one is unique. If you found the back of a frill off any one of these dinosaurs without the rest of the body, part of one bone, you could determine exactly what that species is. And if you find the back of a frill with, the, with all those ornamentations in place, and you compare it to every other ornamentation on other horned dinosaurs, and it's different, then you can actually legitimately name that a new species or a new genus, depending on how you write your paper. I do this, I've done this in the past. Um, there was a beautiful skeleton I dug up in Dinosaur Provincial Park where I got 99.9% .9 of the skeleton, but I missed the back part of the shield and I can't tell you what genus it is. That's how frustrating it can become. So if we have sexual selection in dinosaurs, that means that dinosaurs must be sexually dimorphic. It, it makes sense that you need to be able to tell males from females. Is there evidence in the fossil record that we can tell one one sex of dinosaur from another. There's been some work done on the little horned dinosaur from Asia called Protoceratops. Um, a scientist named Peter Dodson back in the 70s, and some of his earliest research looked at the large variety of skulls that had been collected from Asia, from Mongolia and China, and he determined that there were two morphologies. On the left, there was a, a large, robust with a, a skull with a large shield, which he called males. On the right, there's a more gracile a skull with a smaller shield, which he called a female. And he did some, uh, some rudimentary stats and proved it statistically. So that's, this has been the only example of sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. More recently, uh, one of the graduate students from Italy that I've been involved with uh, re-examined the data for protoceratops and added more specimens to it. Um, don't worry about this diagram. All it proves is that math was done on the, the data to come up with a result. Therefore, it's true. Um, and it suggests that, that if you look at all the ceratops, all the protoceratopsian skulls that have been designated males and female, they form a cluster. There is not one cluster that says I'm all, these are all males and one cluster that are all females. So the black dots are ones that have been referred to as male, the white dots are ones that have been referred to as females. And although you can look at black dots on the far right part of the illustration and white dots on the far left side, you can see that they're also um, um, a large conglomeration there in the middle. So is there sexual dimorphism in protoceratops? No. So does this mean that there's no sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs? Well, there's no bony evidence for it. But when you look at modern living dinosaurs, birds, how do you tell them apart? Plumage, vocalization, soft tissue characters, which don't preserve for the most part in dinosaurs. So I suspect that if we could actually go back, roll that time machine back, and put the skin and feathers and whatever else soft tissue features around those dinosaurs, and listen to them vocalize, as I'm sure they did, 
that's how we could tell males from females. We'll be able to, will we be able to do this and determine this definitively in our own research? Um, probably not in my lifetime, but there's a number of Case Western students out here and ISO potential students that we can work with. And I've got some really cool projects that I'd like to work, talk to some of you about that may actually follow this forward. If we've got a few more minutes, I wanted to talk about um, something that's near and dear to my heart, Triceratops. A few years ago, some of you may have heard that Triceratops no longer exists. That was actually a false news release. What they actually meant to say was that Taurosaurus no longer exists. So at the very end of the age of dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, Triceratops is the only large-bodied horned dinosaur around. So there's Triceratops on the upper part. It's facing uh, toward the left. You can see its little pointy nose horn, big horns over the eyes, and that sort of round shield coming off the back. There is also another dinosaur which is found in the same sediments of the Hell Creek and Lance Formation called Taurosaurus. It too has a short horn over the nose, large horns over the eyes, but it has an even bigger shield off the back of the skull and absolutely the skull is lar the largest Taurosaur skull is largest, larger than the largest Triceratops skull. Plus it has holes in the shield, whereas Triceratops does not. So a number of scientists, primarily working in Montana, Jack Horner, Mark Goodwin, um, John Scanella have been looking at the growth patterns of Triceratops. So in the upper left, we see a little baby Triceratops, and as we move from left to right through each one of the rows up to and excluding the bottom right-hand corner, which is Taurosaurus, that's a growth series for Triceratops. Jack Horner has uh, done many fantastic things in his career, which he continues to do even after he retires. But one of the best things he did was create the Hill Creek Project where he wanted to collect as many Triceratops and as many T-Rex specimens as he could, not just for display, but to build up a testable database. It's really hard to postulate theories in paleontology when you only have one example of a species or two examples of a genus. You need large databases to test theories. So he's now got hundreds of Triceratops skulls and dozens of T-Rex skeletons. And as you, uh, when you look at your data, this is a simplified version of how these things grow from small to large. So if you look at the horns over the eyes for Triceratops, they start off as small little nubbins. They get longer and they recurve backwards towards the back of the shield. And as the animal gets older, they actually rotate forward again. The horn over the nose gets substantially longer. It never gets really long, but it gets longer. And the shield off the back of the skull does get significantly longer. Then there's a discontinuity and you get into the very large giant Taurosaurus skulls, which are the size of, of a small car. The skulls are amazingly large. So John and Jack and Mark would suggest that Taurosaurus is just an old Triceratops. This is what happens when Triceratops gets bigger than the biggest known, um, biggest known Triceratops, it becomes Taurosaurus. <clears throat> is this true? Um, their lab believes it is so and they've got a lot of great evidence for it. Um, I wish it was true. I wish I believed it more than I do um, because I find that there's a few problems with their arguments. And we talked about the extra bony ossifications that, that, that line the frill. And in some cases, in the centrosaurs, develop into hooks and horns. They don't do much in Triceratops, but they are there. And there's a leap in number from the number you see on the frills of Triceratops to the number you see in Taurosaurus. It's not a sequential adding on as they get older, they just, there's a giant discontinuity. So as much as I like John, Jack, and Mark, I'm not convinced that we're actually seeing those, uh, uh, we're, we're, that Taurosaurus is actually Triceratops. So a big X through that for the moment. <laughs> Please don't tell Jack or John that. And we've actually had many discussions at the bar over this. And the, uh, there's a whole new series of data which is just being published as we speak which speaks to the stratigraphic arrangement of both Taurosaurus and Triceratops, and I'm happy to be proved wrong, which is what I think the best scientists do. With that, I put up a Xenoceratops drawing that I like very much, and I welcome questions. Thank you. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at 
origins.case.edu.